Wait just a second. Just a second. It's the elbow. Guitarist. <laughs> He's reading the thing. What's his name? Rocky, get up here. <laughs> He's coming. He's coming. <laughs> what? Our guitar guy. He's coming. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome. How are you today? <laughs> We're doing a little different today. We have piano. <laughs> if you will stand to worship with us this morning. church. So nice to see all of you here this morning. Um, unfortunately, we did reschedule the shrimp boiled. No, I'm just kidding. Is this what it takes to get so many of you out today? There's so many people here today. I love this. So shrimp boil every Sunday. That's what we're going to have to do. 
No, it, it's wonderful to have you all. I, I'm looking forward to an amazing service this morning. Uh, just some brief announcements before we get back to worshiping this morning. Obviously, uh, we do have the shrimp boil. Greg's back there cooking. Several people back there working it, getting ready. So uh, we invite you all to stick around. Uh, the cost is $5 per person. Everyone ages four and up. But again, like I've said to many people, do not let the cost keep you from staying. If it's the cost that's keeping you from staying afterwards, come see me, talk to somebody. You're going to get to eat. So just uh, let us know. We want you here for that. Uh, Bible study this Wednesday, 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to continue in the book of Colossians, so please, please be here for that. I have a surprise coming up next month for the Bible study that will probably draw a lot of you to that, too. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that as well. Um, thank you for everyone that participated. You can have a seat. I do tend to get long-winded. I'm sorry. You, we'll stand back during worship. I should have told you that when I started. Uh, but thank you to everyone who participated in our Bartow Women's Care Center collection over the last several weeks. Uh, your donations are, are really going to make a world of difference in the lives of so many. And so thank you for that. Um, our next uh, Ladies in Praise meeting will be Saturday, March 18th at 10 a.m. It'll be here at the church. And as usual, please, please bring a brunch item if you plan to attend that. And then last but not least, our uh, Ladies in Praise uh, they're collecting items to create some theme baskets. And your uh, women's ministry table back there, you'll see the sign-ups for that. Um, there's going to be a silent auction that's going to be held on uh, March 19th through April 2nd. So see Katie. She's not here today. But reach out to Katie, see her, or uh, take a look at that ministry table, and it'll have all the info you need for your ladies in praise. But with that being said, uh, how many are excited to worship this morning? I know the food's coming. We're excited about that. But Let's really come and celebrate and stand before our Lord, praise him, uh, be fed this morning, and really be in tune. Amen. I turn it over to you all. All the saints and angels. glory I 
want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real, death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, great I am. I want to be near, near to your heart. Loving the world, hating the dark. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, great I am. Who is worthy, none beside thee. God Almighty, great I am. He's the great I am. The mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell nor any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, great I am, great I am. forward and the children are dismissed <laughs> all right if you will pray with me almighty god we come before you today in awe and reverence. As we faithfully bring our tithes and offerings, please multiply them in order to further your kingdom. God, thank you for Pastor Anthony and the word that he's going to bring us today and help open our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. And this next song is a prayer song. Um, so if you have anything heavy on your hearts today, um, just bring it to God sharing this one. I'm praying God come and turn this thing around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. 
God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. Changes everything. God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. God turn. God turn it around. 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 He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something. Right now, he is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something. Right now, he is moving mountains, making the way for someone. God is doing something. Right now, all of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come. Come in the name, the name of Jesus. God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around. God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around. I'm praying God come. Turn this thing around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Will you guys bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to just come together each and every week to just glorify your name, to listen to a message that you've laid on Pastor Anthony's heart to just give us the ears to listen, the heart to receive. Lord, we know you're working in this church. We know that what we're doing here is working in the community, Lord. We look around. We see people that need help, Lord. We've, you've called us to step up as a church, to step up as a community, to raise leaders, to raise young ones, to be leaders, Lord. We thank you. We love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. button pushed because normally I can hear my echo. Am I good? All right, there we go. Now you can hear me. See, normally if I don't hear myself and I don't know if that's a good thing, then I know something's wrong. So, well, it's wonderful to see all your smiling faces this morning. And again, I'm, I'm looking forward to fellowshipping with all of you uh, when we get out there and do our shrimp boil here in a little bit. But um, what a wonderful worship set this morning. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, worship team, for that. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, right now, we've been just focusing on the, the I am statements of Jesus, something so profound, so beautiful in the word of God. And we are going to be in week four this week, week four of the I am statements. Um, and I'm loving this series so far. It, it's been an impact on me, an impact on my family, and I pray it's having an impact on you as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I absolutely love animals. Any animal lovers in here, right? Oh, a lot of animal lovers. That's wonderful. They are absolutely delicious, aren't they? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Just teasing. Uh, 
I am, I am an animal lover as well. Um, all jokes aside, I, I love them so much. There was a point in my life when I was young that I actually thought about becoming a, a veterinarian. And um, I, I had it all planned out. I was going to go to school. I was going to get my degree. I was going to make a ton of money. I wasn't going to work very hard because that's what I always thought veterinarians did. Boy, was I wrong. But... I, I, hanging over my life was the fact that growing up, I always hung out with the wrong crowd. I think there were many of us that did that. We hung out with the wrong crowd. I went down a different path. Obviously, now the Lord has me standing here preaching each and every Sunday. So that was not my calling, and this is, right? The Lord grabbed a hold of me, and the rest is history. I get to stand up here each and every Sunday, feed into your lives. And to be honest with you, I would not have it any other way way. Now, with that being said, back to being an animal lover, which I am. In my house, we have a black lab named JJ, we have a pit bull named Jade, and we have a bearded dragon named Bruni. And so that's who we, that's the animals we currently have now. Now, back in Ohio at one point, we had three tiny dogs, and some of you are going to go, oh, but man, they were hard. We had a Maltese named Caesar, we had a Yorkie named Sammy, and we had a Maltese Pooh whose name was Stanley. It was a dog that was literally that big. Didn't even know they made dogs that big. Um, They all had very, very distinct personalities. And they all listened to Heather and I with different levels of obedience. Same can be said about our kids. They all listen with different levels of obedience, right? Well, Caesar, he was the ornery one of the bunch. He was what I called the three C's. He was cute, cuddly, and absolutely crazy. So... (laughs) With that being said, he was a destroyer of all things, right? Destroyer of all things. He would sneak around the house, getting into things he wasn't supposed to. I would usually wind up chasing him around the house, yelling, no, Caesar, no, don't chew on that, don't eat that. And that's literally how I spent most of my day when I was home with him. And then finally, I would catch him. I would take whatever he was chewing up. I would scold him, to which he would growl a high-pitched noise that made him sound like he was possessed. I'll have to share the video sometime. It was crazy. It was really, really hard. But he wanted our attention all the time, right? Even if it was bad attention. We love those dogs, right? But that was before children. And none of those tiny dogs were good with our kids. And so ultimately, friends ended up taking them. And now we have much bigger dogs that are very, very good with kids. But all that being said, Caesar, the reason I wanted to talk about that a little bit, Caesar was known for going after things that he wasn't supposed to have, and we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Now, I'm not sure how much time Jesus spent with animals growing up as a carpenter's son, but every Jewish boy knew about sheep. They knew about sacrifices. They knew about sheep, goats, heifers, bulls, as well as doves and pigeons, and obviously, if you read the scriptures, that'll tell you that. Um, They were all part of the Jewish culture back in Jesus' day. And because of that, they knew what it was to be a clean animal. They knew what it was to be an unclean animal. They knew how different each one of them was from one another. And so I'm going to go to John chapter 10 and verses 11 through 15 here is what I believe I told Becky. So it says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I believe he more than anyone else understood how sheep operate, what their needs were, what their personalities like. In my opinion, Jesus believes we people, the people he created, the people he knew, we're a lot like sheep in the fact that we need love and constant protection, right? I love my children, you know, there, there's no bounds to how much I love my children. The good, the bad, the, the lengths I would go to to protect my children. Are, are, there's no <laughs> amount of words I can put into that, right? And so when we think about sheep, sheep are very, very similar. Sometimes we as humans, though, and the reason I started off the story with my dog Caesar, we as humans, we're a lot like my old dog Caesar. 
We grab what we're not supposed to have, and we run from our master with it, firmly clenched in our grasp. I think a lot of us can relate to that this morning, right? Many times in life, we've done things we know we're not supposed to do. We might be currently doing things we're not supposed to do. We grab hold of it, and we will not let go of it no matter what. Even though the master says, no, I don't want you to have that. Let go of it. And we don't listen, do we? We think we know what's best. Caesar thought he knew it was best. He did not want to let go of it. The only time we tend to release it is when we finally get caught. A lot of us are like that. When the Lord convicts us, when we feel caught, when we feel cornered, yeah, we're okay to release it at that point. You know what, Lord, you kind of got me. I'm really feeling guilty this morning, so I'm willing to, to let it go. No, not when the master, throughout the whole time we're praying, we're reading, we're in communication with him. We don't let go of it then, only when we feel cornered and caught. And I read a poem this week by Francis Thompson. I'm not going to actually read it all. But he was a one-time opium addict who died of tuberculosis in 1907. The Christian poem is titled The Hound of Heaven. I encourage you to read that this week. It's called The Hound of Heaven. In this poem, he talks about a redeemed man who was constantly running from Jesus. He tried to, to get away for years. He went into the very depths of sin and despair to try and outrun Jesus as best he could. But Jesus continually chased after him. Jesus would not give up on him. He kept calling him by name. He knew the life he had in store for this man before the world was created. And I have news for all of you this morning, whether this is your first time here, whether this is your you know, 30th year here. The Lord has a plan for your life. He has a direction that he wants you to go. Maybe you're not on that direction right now. Maybe you're not headed on that exact path in this moment. But your path, the plan he has for you, it can change in an instant. Now, his plan's not changing. He knows what it is. But the path that you've set yourself on that goes against the path he has designed for you, it can change in an instant if you allow it to, right? Jesus knows the life he has in store for you. He knew the life he had in store for this man in the poem. And because of that love, he refuses to let that man settle. He refuses to let you settle for something other than his love and his holiness, right? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 says this. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every one of us has run away from Jesus at one time or another, right? There may be some of you this morning who's still running. Every one of us has chased after things in this life that we shouldn't be chasing, and we've held on to them far too long. But the good shepherd, he comes searching for us. He will not give up on us. And that's when he came, when Jesus came, he literally died to save you. We're going to obviously be talking about that leading up to Easter. And so I've got a question for you this morning. Have you ever tried to help someone who didn't want to be helped? You ever tried to help someone who didn't want to be helped? Maybe a son, maybe a daughter, grandchild who was just destined for destruction no matter what you said or did. Perhaps a friend that continually chased after things that ripped their family apart limb by limb. Or maybe you've watched your mom and dad continually choose a path that was destroying their life. Or maybe you, maybe you yourself have embarked on a path and you just hell-bent on destruction day by day by day. No matter what pastor, what brother or sister, what family member, what friend has come into your life, they haven't flipped the switch yet. See, the funny thing is, as a pastor, I already knew the answer to that question before I asked you. It was more of a rhetorical question, if you will. Every single one of us sitting in this room today has. And not only that, but before we began our relationship with Jesus, many of us were the ones, again, running headfirst into that destruction ourselves. In your hearts, though, those of us that know Christ now, I hope that's all of you. There's a lot of people here today. 
So maybe not all of you. But those of us that know Jesus now, did we ever give up? Did we ever stop praying? Did we ever stop seeking God? Those of us that truly know Jesus now, did we ever quit crying out? No, we didn't, or we wouldn't be where we are today. So the reason I say that is those people in your life, family, friends, sons, daughters, grandchildren, that seem like there's absolutely no getting through to them, don't stop reaching out. Don't stop praying for them. Do not stop letting them know that you care, and do not stop letting them know that Jesus Christ loves them. Amen? But you want to know something? The fact that you love them, you care for them, something even more amazing than that kind of love, which is a, it's a big love. God loves you and me more. Jesus loves you, loves them more. He chases every single one of us down that path of rebellion, sin, and self-sufficiency, hoping, like the prodigal son, that we turn back and come home. In verse 14, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, he's saying more than just, I know their names, I know their personality. He's saying, I know what it's like to be one of them. It's not something we think a lot about in the church. We talk about Jesus. We know Jesus was human, right? Everybody knows that? Nod your heads. Okay. We know that he went to the cross. We know that he was crucified. We know that he was resurrected. And we think about that a lot. We talk about it on Easter. We talk about it other times of the year. But we often forget about the human, the humanistic side of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take you to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, and it says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Talking about Jesus now. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, Jesus felt the same way, the same desire to give in just as we so often do. We don't think about that a lot, do we? Because he fully understands what it's like to be tempted. He was fully human again. He knows his sheep. And many times we fight this as Christians going our own way, only to turn around and fail. See, I thought about my selfishness the other day. I'm going to give you a little bit of <laughs> humanistic side about Pastor Anthony. I thought about this for a minute. I was like, should I really talk? I'm going to do it anyway. So we're going to do it. For those of you that know me, and there's people in the youth group and maybe pastoral assistants that can vouch for this, I like to drive a little too fast sometimes, okay? I like to pass cars that go slow um, because, honestly, I just don't like being on someone's bumper in front of me. I like to look out and see the empty road. It's not that people are preventing me from getting somewhere. I just don't like cars in front of me. I know that's not going to win me any safest driver of the year awards in my snapshot from Progressive. I hope they're not listening. It's probably not too happy about it. But it's the way that I've always been. I remember a few weeks back, I was on my way home from the church, and there's a spot on Spirit Lake Road when you're heading, heading north where two lanes become one right there at Record Highway. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, right? Okay, good. Well... I normally fly down the far left lane and pass as many as I can, and obviously the left lane's the one that continues straight, so oftentimes I'll drift into the right lane and blow by everybody. However, this time there was a car who beat me to the punch, right? He wanted to do the same thing. He beat me and all the other cars, and as I caught up to him, he kind of flashed me the peace sign but didn't have his pointer finger up <laughs> when I got to the light. And so I kind of took that as a sign, okay, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Maybe this isn't something I should have done. But why did I do that? Well, we all know why, right? I want my own way. I always want to be first. Like Ricky, Ricky Bobby says, if you're not first, you're last. Many of you won't get that reference. But if you're, you 
It's just embedded in me. That might be the sin, you know, something that I need to correct. That's what the Lord's working on me. Jesus knows that temptation. I'm prone to sin just like anybody else. But take away the car aspect of it. Jesus felt just like I did. But the difference between Jesus and myself is he never fell victim to the temptation to actually do it. See, we do. We get the road rages. We have to blow by people. We have to do this. We have to do that. We watch the television shows. Well, it's a PG-13. Okay, it's an R rating, but they only say this word this many times, and they only show this much that they shouldn't show. We make deals within deals within ourselves, and we walk up to that line of temptation, dangle the foot over, put the body over, want to see how far we can get to it without doing it. The reason I wanted to tell that story is your pastor's not exempt from those things. We all have that sinful desire embedded in us. And we fall victim to it when we don't lean on Jesus, right? So you might be saying to yourself, okay, well, what hope do those of us have that fall victim? What, what can we do? Well, just like Paul says in the book of Hebrews, Jesus, he knows our temptations. Listen to this. We read in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9 this. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. How did Jesus become the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him? Well, listen to Jesus' own words in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. So continuing with the, the good shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay, my da lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. See, God the Father had a plan to save his wayward sheep. I've mentioned this before. This wasn't some plan he just constructed after the ark had said, well, they didn't listen to that. They didn't do this. I'm just gonna. This was always the plan. Even before Adam and Eve turned their backs on God, this was the plan. And I want to read a section of scripture to you from the New Living Translation. I actually talked to a friend of mine about the NLT this morning, the New Living Translation of scripture. It's a version I often read at times by myself, and honestly, it's the version I was saved under because in my biblical lack thereof, when I was coming to Christ, it was hard for me to read King James. It was hard for me to read NIV, and so I learned through the NLT. It's helpful for us to understand God's plan through the death of Jesus, and this really, really helped me. So we're going to go Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, and it says this. Even before he made the world... God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. He chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. He works everything out according to his plan. So before I go into the closing part this morning, you have to understand whether you, your son, your daughter, grandchild, whoever it is, whether you've been on a, a path of destruction, whether you've lived what you would quote unquote call a very rough life at this point, God still has a plan for you. If you're drawing breath in your lungs this morning, God has a plan for you. It doesn't have to continue. The heartbreak, the horror that you see, the, the, the destruction that you continue to self-inflict every single day, that doesn't have 
to continue. Many of the people that, that attend this church regularly, many of the people that know me and have heard my testimony from day one, they can attest I was the same way. Have not always been a Christian man. Have not always been a pastor. I lived a very, very, very destructive life to which my wife saw a very small piece of when we first started dating. He can take you out of that. He can immediately change that. It's not, a lot of people like to say it just starts with an instantaneous prayer. Yeah, that's the beginning. You want to talk to God in that moment and ask, but it's a path. They call it a marathon for a reason. It's not a sprint. So for those of you this morning, and there's a lot of you here, many, many faces I haven't seen. If you need prayer this morning, something has tickled your ears, something spoke to you this morning, and you want someone to pray with you, pray over you, come over to this side as the band plays the last song here in a little bit. If you want to just do some time with the Lord at the altar on your own, come over to this side. Nobody's going to judge you. No one's going to mock, ridicule, anything like that. Isn't it time things change? Isn't it time things in your life, whatever it is? I've seen people posting on Facebook about God, and, and, and there's so much happening. So many people who weren't drawn to God that are being drawn recently. There's a reason for that. There's things happening in this country that many of us can't explain. But what I can't explain, and I go to the ultimate truth to do so, is that God has a plan. And that secret plan, it became a, a public display as his son purchased our freedom through the death of his son on a cross. The good shepherd, he opened the gate for all his wayward sheep to come home. No wonder he said, I am the gate followed by, I am the good shepherd. He is the shepherd and the door that leads us home. And I want to close today's sermon with a, a very important truth. See, shepherds, they value sheep, right? Shepherds definitely value sheep. And butchers, they do not. Well, Lynn Anderson in the book, They Smell Like Sheep, it is a real book, I promise, talks about this. It says this. Several years ago in Palestine, Carolyn and Lynn, they rode a tour bus through Israel's countryside. Nearly mesmerized, the tour guide explained the scenery, the history, and the lifestyle. In his description, he included a, a heartwarming portrayal of the ancient shepherd and sheep relationship, right? Kind of like what we talked about in scripture today. He expounded on how the, the shepherd builds a relationship with his sheep, how he feeds them, how he gently cares for them, all the things that Jesus would do. He pointed out that the shepherd doesn't drive the sheep, but leads them. And the sheep does not need to be harsh with them, or the shepherd does not need to be harsh with the sheep because they hear his voice and follow. He then explained how on a previous tour things had backfired on him as he was giving this same speech about the sheep and the shepherds. In the midst of this spinning pastoral tale and it was going very well, he suddenly realized he had lost his entire audience. They were all looking out the window completely just engulfed in what was taking place. Here they saw this shepherd throwing rocks, whacking sheep with sticks, doing all these things you couldn't possibly name, and they couldn't understand why, right? The sheep-driving man in the field had completely ruined this guy's enchanting narrative of what he was trying to explain between the relationship between a sheep and a shepherd. The guy told us that he was so agitated, he jumped off the bus, he ran into the field, and he confronted him. And he asked, I was spinning this charming story. I had everybody listening, and here you are doing things that a shepherd would never do beating these sheep, throwing rocks at them. What gives? Why would you do this? For a moment, Shepherd had a bewildered look on his face. And then the light dawned on him. He blurted out, man, you've got me all wrong. I'm not a shepherd. I'm a butcher. He was, <laughs> he was going after him. The poor unwitting fellow had just provided the tour guide with all of us on what a good shepherd is not. To the shepherd... The sheeps are named what? Floppy, fluffy, cotton, fun names like that. He knows them. He loves them. He protects them. He feeds them. He waters them. He carries them when they're hurt. The butcher kills it, bleeds it out, roasts it over a fire and sells it. He takes its life, pockets the money, and that's about the extent of it. You see, Satan is worse than the butcher. He's a thief. He steals, he steals sheep from the shepherd so he can kill them. And Jesus knew this truth, and you know the scripture. 
The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The good shepherd comes to give real, abundant life. I close with this. Have you ever had something stolen from you? I think a lot of us have, right? Left a gate open. A bunch of people back there had some stuff stolen. Something that you value cannot be replaced, right? Thieves could care less that it's your grandfather's stopwatch or it was your mother's necklace. They don't care about that. They care less how valuable and important it is to you, how hard you work to get it. They don't care what you paid for it. All of that makes no difference to a thief, right? That's exactly how Satan feels about you and me, according to Jesus. Satan's a thief that butchers sheep for his own benefit. Jesus, the good shepherd, died to save every single one of us. So I leave you with this thought this morning. Which voice are you listening to? Which voice are you listening to? Because oftentimes in this world, the things that we consider entertainment, the things that we consider okay and of this world, and we're just doing what everybody else does, it's often Satan in disguise. And we fall victim to it, hook, line, and sinker so often. So which voice are you listening to? Do you recognize his voice calling you this morning? Do you recognize what he's trying to do? Do you listen to Jesus ask you to trust him? And and take the next step in your walk. Again, the altar's open this morning for prayer. And I mean this. A lot of people say, I wish I would have just listened to you when you said for us to come forward. I wish I wouldn't have been so shy. If God is tugging at your heart this morning to come forward, come and pray. We're going to go eat in a moment. We're going to fellowship. We're going to spend time together. This is the business aspect of things. This is the important part. This is why we truly came this morning. Yes, it's going to be fun to eat and talk and sit in the 90-degree heat together. That'll be great. But this is the important part. If you have business to do with God this morning, do not let another day go by without you speaking to him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for being the good shepherd. Thank you for chasing after us when we, we go astray. Lord, thank you for caring for us. Thank you for loving us. Lord, I know there's people in here this morning thinking to themselves they don't want to be set on destruction anymore. They don't want to have family or friends or anybody else set on destruction this morning, Lord. Lord, let us turn it over to you. Let us relinquish our will for yours. Let us focus on you this morning as we leave. God, as we get ready to go in fellowship and enjoy a wonderful shrimp boil together, May we honor you, may we praise you, may we give you all the glory, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in the life of this church. Thank you for what you're doing in each person's individual life as they lean more on you. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Apparently, my daughter Addie felt she had lots of business to do with God this morning, and she lays at the altar. (laughs) Well, as you leave this morning, understand that (laughs) no matter where you've been this week, no matter where you've been this month, or even the last few years, if your walk is just beginning with the Lord, if, if you want your walk to take the next step, on the bulletins that you received as you walked in this morning, you've got my email, you've got my phone number. I'd be more than happy to talk, to pray with, to help any single one of you to be able to further your walk with God. That's what I'm supposed to do. It's my calling, and it's not like I'm the type of person that goes, oh, geez, I can't believe so and I, I get excited when people call and reach out. For those that are attending for, for the first time or this is your first visit here, I pray that this becomes your home church. I pray that you felt um, excitement as you walked in. I pray you enjoyed the worship setting. I do know we are a church that absolutely loves people. We follow the Spirit in all that we do, and we truly care for this community. And you've seen so much change in the 17 months that I've been here and, and, and everyone's life and the fact that they want to know Jesus more. And just like the song said, it takes surrendering it all. It takes surrendering everything. So this morning, as you get ready to leave, is your focus on Jesus? I ask you that. That's good. That's good. Thank you, Chandler. If your focus is on Jesus, that is great. But if it needs some work, you need someone to walk with you, please again, I implore you, reach out to me while we're back there eating. You will not bother my meal. That's what I'm here for. I love you all. I thank you for coming this morning. And I pray you do enjoy the time out there at the Shrimp Boil. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for every single person here, Lord. And I pray that everyone gets to know everyone out here, Lord. I pray that everybody feels welcome. Uh, We get a chance to talk about all things you, Lord. And and this moment, as we go out here and eat together, break bread together, Lord, I pray that we glorify you. God, give us the the strength to go out this week into our towns, our communities, our places of work, and honor you in all that we do. Let us uh, take that next step in our reading and our prayer life so we can honor you in all that we do. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.